All right, welcome to our nine o'clock press workshop on climate change and El Nino. Does global warming matter for the climate of the tropics? With us today, we have Christina Karam Perdu from the University of Hawaii at Manoa. We have Jessica Tierney from the University of Arizona, Pedro Denizio from the University of Texas at Austin, and Mark Kane from the Earth Institute at Columbia University. I'm gonna turn it over to Christina. Thank you for the introduction and thank you all for being here. So this year's uh, theme at ADU is uh, to celebrate the past and inspire the future. So I think it is fitting to start with the note that um, a lot of the early understanding and, and research on El Nino Southern Oscillation and its impact um, both in the tropics and outside the tropics is based on this seminal paper by um, Jacob Bjorkness. It was written 50 years ago and is entitled Atmospheric Teleconnections from the Equatorial Pacific. And as the uh, title reveals, Bjorkman has really made the case for um, wh when we have temperature anomalies, warm temperatures in the tropical Pacific, that affects weather and climate um, outside of the tropics. And also he made the case that this is a coupled atmosphere ocean phenomenon, meaning that you need the ocean and the atmosphere processes to interact um, in uh, certain ways to give you the development of an El Nino event. So Pjerknes didn't have much to work with back then. Uh, he based his um, um, conclusions on three El Nino events, the 57-58, the 63-64, and the 65-66. So as you see here from this uh, record of uh, 70 years of El Nino index, where red indicates an El Nino event and blue indicates a El Nino event. These three events are relatively small or moderate. And uh, since Bjorkness died in 1975, I believe, uh, he didn't have the chance um, uh, to experience and study the three largest El Nino events we've seen. Uh, the 1982-83 event, which was devastating for um, especially for the Far Eastern Pacific, the Galapagos, and uh, the uh, marine life there. Uh, the 97-98 event, which is very famous for um, the extreme rainfall in California and also the devastating impacts in Peru, and uh, also famous by Chris Farley and Yosho El Nino. And um, the largest, uh, the larger, um, most recent one, the 2015-2016 event. Um, so, in a sense, 50 years and three large El Nino events and three generations of researchers later, we have, uh, later we have much more, um, many more lines of evidence to go on to understand El Nino. So, uh, not only do we have satellite observations, but we also have a dedicated observing system in the tropical Pacific um, of buoys that are maintained by NOAA. We also have paleoclimate records, and my fellow speakers will um, elaborate on that. And we have model simulations from um, numerical models that are limited to simulating the tropical Pacific, uh, like the famous uh, Zibia Kane model, Kane being um, the gentleman present here, uh, which was used to make the uh, first successful prediction of El Nino uh, using a model uh, back in 1985, to the state of the art sort of uh, earth system models with all the bells and whistles that we have today. And all of these new lines of evidence in this past 50 years corroborated the view that uh, Bjerknes had that, um, and, and added more complexity to that, that um, El Nino is such a complex phenomenon and you need all these processes, um, to, uh, including upper ocean physics and also very importantly, uh, the physics of clouds, uh, both the high clouds and the, in the West Pacific over the warm waters and the low clouds in the East Pacific over the cold waters. Uh, all of these to really come together in a perfect storm to give you a big El Nino event or a, a La Nina event. And uh, it is important to note here that we have El Nino events in our models and there's no, uh, that arise spontaneously from the model solving the equations of motion of the ocean and the atmosphere. Uh, so by representing the processes that are important for um, for uh, an El, Ni El Nino development, the models create El Nino events, but there's no switch that you turn on to say, well, model, you need to have an El Nino, right? Um, so the other um, uh, aspect of El Nino that the Bjergnes didn't or couldn't know back then that we are very interested in the past few years um, is that El Nino comes in many flavors or many faces. Um, we have events where 
um, the sea surface temperature uh, warming uh, could is more uh, is this there? okay here um, is log is concentrated in the East Pacific or more in the Central Pacific. And what is important about these flavors of El Nino is that their impacts are different. So um, this plot here shows the impact on precipitation. Blue colors mean you have more, and, um, and the, the brown colors mean you have less precipitation when you have each one of these uh, El Nino events. So I think we can all appreciate that we have um, areas where if you have one type of El Nino, you'll get more rainfall, but if you have the other type of El Nino, you'll actually get less rainfall. So obviously the holy grail or the uh, important questions out there is whether all of these will change in a warmer world. And um, however El Nino itself might change in a warmer world, it will be superposed on a altered state of the mean tropical Pacific. So you see here, this is from the most recent uh, IPCC report. Uh, the majority of models project that um, with a warmer world, you will have more of this warming in the East Pacific on average. And this pattern looks a little bit like what we see during an El Nino event. Um, so the question um, there is whether the way that the mean climate changes in the Pacific is related to how El Nino itself is changing, whether you see more El Nino events or less El Nino events, stronger or, or weaker. And um, this is a very complex question to answer, but I believe we are making progress. Um, if you look at this, um, the pattern of whether you are more El Nino-like or La Nina-like, um, as you respond to greenhouse gas warming, this is for a high emission scenario from the most recent uh, generation of models, uh, versus the percentage of change that you can see in El Nino activity, then you see there's a relationship there that becomes more consistent when you're looking um, at the models that do a little bit better in uh, representing uh, basic El Nino characteristics, including that uh, those El Nino flavors that I was um, just talking about. Um, so. And the other important um, aspect of how models are simulating El Nino is that uh, their skill in doing that is a good indicator of how they are generally performing in simulating processes like clouds, for example, and cloud radiation feedbacks that are important not just for climate change in the tropical Pacific, but also globally. Uh, the good news is that model simulation of the mean tropical Pacific climate and El Nino is improving. Uh, this is a plot that shows the uh, equatorial temperature. Uh, so the middle lines here indicate the tropical Pacific. So you see that going from the previous generation uh, in blue to the next generation of models in red, uh, we come closer and closer to observations in black. Uh, so uh, models are indeed improving. They're improving also in how they simulate uh, El Nino processes. But key challenges remain, of course, and there's a lot of room for even more improvements so that we can um, have uh, more confidence in the future predict predictions of El Nino. So uh, I think that, um, and this is very important because obviously that gives us more skill and ability to understand the global impacts of El Nino, a schematic of which you see uh, here. Uh, so I think um, hopefully if I, or Bjergnes for that matter, uh, has uh, have convinced you that uh, the tropics rule. Uh, we have a, organized a session this afternoon um, based exactly on these 50 years uh, since we have had this seminal um, Bjergnes paper. And the session is uh, entitled after the Bjergnes session, so atmospheric teleconnections of the, from the Equatorial Pacific at 4 p.m. today. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for being here this morning. Um, so my name is Jessica Tierney. I'm actually a paleoclimatologist, so I study climate changes in the past. And the reason I do that is I'm interested in using the past to give us a better idea of where we're headed in the future, um, including the tropical Pacific. So the main point that I'll present to you today is our recent finding that the Pliocene past, so that refers to a time three million years ago, predicts the future of the tropical Pacific. So we actually have a really nice direct analog of where we're headed in the near future by looking back three million years ago.
So let me explain um, what I mean by that. So first of all, let's just consider the structure of the Central Pacific. So the trade winds are blowing from east to west here, and because of that, the warm water tends to pile up next to Indonesia here, and it has a really technical name. It's called the warm pool. Uh, and on, on, in, in, uh, on the other side of the Pacific here, because the winds are blowing this way, you have cold water coming up, so we have our second technical name, which is the cold tongue. And these are both warm places in the tropics, but you can see from the temperatures there that there's about a five degree C difference between the east and the west Pacific, so it's pretty substantial, eight degrees in Fahrenheit scale. Um, but if we look at the geological evolution of the eastern and western Pacific, we can see that this difference has not always been the same. So here I'm showing you a result from a recent paper that we published in AGU's Geophysical Research Letters this year. It's the evolution of sea surface temperatures in the western Pacific in the red line and the eastern Pacific in the blue line. The x-axis is the age and millions of years. And so if we look here on the right, this is time zero, that is today. We see that classical difference between the east and west is five or six degrees. But as we go back in time, these lines come together. And so when we go back to the Pliocene epoch, which is denoted up here at top three million years ago, we see that there's still a difference between the east and the west. There has to be because the trade winds are blowing, but it's, it's much lower. And this is significant because the Pliocene is the last time that CO2 was where we are today, 400 ppm. So that was the last time that we, we are where we are today. So this is basically giving us a signal of what to expect in the future. In this paper, we also went one step further, and we actually put together maps of what sea surface temperatures looked like during the Pliocene, that three million year time period. So that map is here on the left for you. It's the increase in sea surface temperature relative to a pre-industrial baseline. So we're looking at an anomaly plot here. And similar to some of the figures um, that Christina showed you, we see this classic pattern in the Pliocene of warming in the eastern Pacific here, and also the subtropical warming pattern, very high sea surface temperatures off of California, which is a typical response um, in, in associated with this change in the mean state of the tropical Pacific. On the right-hand panel, that's actually a prediction of what the Pacific will look like under a low emission scenario, the RCP 2.6 from the last IPCC AR cycle. And so low emission scenario basically has us holding at 400 ppm, going up to 500 and, and staying there because we have strong mitigation strategies. Nonetheless, we see that the pattern of change in the, in the tropical Pacific, it really looks a lot like the Pliocene, right? So this is the key message is that the Pliocene is the key to our future. It's sort of confirming that the, this pattern that's produced by models is realistic because we actually see it in the geological record. And so this is important for a couple of reasons. The first is there's actually been an ongoing debate in the scientific community about whether the average conditions in the tropical Pacific will resemble an El Nino, what we call an El Nino-like state, or conversely, a La Nina-like state. And there's reasons to expect both, and, and different models do slightly different things. But the Pliocene, is, it enables us to rule out the hypothesis that this is actually a feasible response to high CO2, because the Pliocene is telling us that this is what we should expect. And this is, of course, as Christina mentioned, really important for rainfall patterns around the world. So here we're looking at projections and mean annual precipitation under the low emission scenario, RCP 2.6, sort of maintaining at present day CO2 versus the high emission scenario, RCP 8.5, where we continue to burn fossil fuels. And, and so you can see, in, I sort of circled the regions where we expect responses in rainfall associated with the change in the tropical Pacific, the at, that El Nino-like pattern. So we see more rainfall all along the equator in the eastern Pacific going into Peru. Also, an area that's affected by the tropical Pacific, even though it's farther away, is the Middle East right here. And I've also drawn a circle around where we are right now in California and um, sort of southwest United States more generally, because this is a place where we expect um, the mean state of the tropical Pacific to impact rainfall. We actually expect it to increase the rainfall here. But you can see from these projections that it's not clear how California will fare under higher CO2. It's right on the edge between a blue, the sort of blue-green and the brown color. Um, 
But uh, again, we can go back into the past and get some clues. So where I live in, in western Arizona, we actually see all over the place evidence of large lakes during the Pliocene, that three million year time period that I'm talking about. So this is an example of an ancient lake basin in western Arizona. If you've been to Arizona, you know it's a very dry place. We don't have permanent lake basins down there today. There are quite a few of them during the Pliocene. So that is a clue that we're now investigating to follow up on why was the southwest U.S. actually wetter during the Pliocene. So some related talks that are happening today, or today and, oh sorry, tomorrow and Thursday would be my own talk. It's sort of about um, the, yellow, the last glacial maximum, we can, what we can learn about that. But in particular, um, Dr. Tripti Bhattacharya will be giving a talk about that uh, question about the Pliocene and why it might be wetter in the southwest U.S. Hello, everyone. My name is Pedro Di Nezio. Uh, I'm a climate dynamicist, but I also but I like to work with paleoclimatologists like Jessica, um, trying to understand the past to understand the future. Um, my my uh, take home message is uh, that there was an active El Nino in the Indian Ocean. The Indian Ocean, we haven't talked yet about it, is an Indian Ocean that today is not climatically active. It's quite stable, but 20,000, 21,000 years ago, it was extremely active. And 21,000 years ago, it was not a warmer climate, it was a colder climate, but still serves us to understand how the tropical oceans respond and can hold these surprises that all of the southern a whole basin, an ocean that is now inactive can become active. So how that happens? So the modern, modern Indian Ocean is the least climatically active of all the tropical oceans. So here I'm not showing the mean state of the Pacific like Jessica showed, but how variable it is. So the colors in this map show the magnitude of year-to-year -year fluctuations in sea surface temperatures we control the rainfall in all tropical oceans. And you can see El Nino with, with the largest variability. And then when you focus on the Indian Ocean, there's not a lot going on. If, if you look at the shading, there's a bit of variability off the coast of, Sum of Sumatra and Java here, which we call that the Indian Ocean Dipole, but there's no large-scale fluctuations in sea surface temperatures, which would then bring large-scale impacts in rainfall. So um, we, we, we know that this variability is controlled by the mean state. Uh, and we also knew that 21,000 years ago, the Indian Ocean could have favored a more active Indian Ocean. So we tested this hypothesis with Gustav Tirumalai, who cannot be here today, um, while he was doing a postdoc at the University of Texas. And this, this hypothesis was based on a prediction from a model. So here in the shading, you can see the change in the variability that this model predicted. This is a fully coupled global uh, ocean atmosphere climate model with all the belts and whistles, and then we change the boundary conditions to simulate this, the last ice age 21,000 years ago. And the model predicted this increase in variability that you can see here. These are changes in a percentage relative to a baseline. So you can see changes up to 100%. That's a, a doubling of, of the magnitude of the variability of the coast of Sumatra. So um, we have uh, sediment cores that store climate information and in, in sediments in the, the bottom of the ocean, the ships that you can send to, to get those cores, those sediments, and then analyze them and extract climate proxies from those bugs called rub, uh, um, G rubber, and then from them estimate how the, the viability was. Because each one of these bugs, these foraminifera, um, they're microscopic. You have to look at them on the microscope. That's Kausab looking at the microscope. And in the sediments, and each one lives for a month. So it gives you a snapshot of one month. So if you look at many of them, you can have an estimate of how viable things were at any given time in the past. So Kausa looked at the micro microscope and picked uh, almost a thousand of these bugs um, to compare a pre-industrial baseline with this uh, last glacial maximum 21,000 years ago, and then estimated the changes in climate variability uh, back then in those four sites, and then we compare them with the model. So here in circles, 
you have the measurements that, again, the relative change, so you can see these are huge changes, and in the boxes, it's the model. And you can see that this is a, these are equations solved on a computer, and which we are comparing with geochemical measurements made on these microscopic uh, bugs, and they, they all match quite nicely, showing this massive increase in variability in the Indian Ocean, which tells us that the, the Indian Ocean, although it's inactive today, it can, become, it can become active and produce this variability that can produce um, unprecedented climate extremes. And in our simulations, the variability looks like in this plot. So here we're not looking at changes in mean state, it's just how the fluctuations look relative to that mean state back 21,000 years ago in the Indian Ocean, and that's an El Nino in the Pacific. That's the latest El Nino in 2015, 2016. And you see that the patterns are quite similar. The magnitude is not as large, but it still can produce um, unprecedented hydrological extremes in all the countries surrounding the Indian Ocean. Um, so the Indian Ocean could become active in the future, causing unprecedented climate extremes. I won't show you any figures because that paper is not published yet. Uh, but I'll be talking about those results today, uh, later, at the end of the day, at, at the Viernes session. And then there's other related talks about how these changes in El Nino can produce new extremes and all the glorious details are about changes in El Nino on Friday. Um, Um, I don't have any slides, which is always a challenge for people like me because we, we're used to using them as a crutch. My, the three younger people who have spoken ahead of me have given you a good overview of uh, a great deal of what we've learned in the 50 years since Bjorkness wrote this landmark paper. In fact, most of what they talked about is probably uh, comes out of the last decade or perhaps a little more, which is is really amazing. The the level of progress is is in many ways quite astonishing. One of the uh, things I'll emphasize first is the work on the Pliocene that Je Jessica talked about. Um, there isn't a lot of support for research on the Pliocene compared to what I think there should be given that this is indeed the last time the planet temperatures, CO2 levels, looked like what they're about to look like. And uh, you would think there would be a more, more urgency in learning more about what the Earth was exactly like then. And as Jessica said, the message seems to be in line with most, but not all models, but most, that um, things will get to a more El Nino-like state, and one of the implications of that would be the expectation that uh, California and Southwest, like Arizona, would get wetter. Um, I'll come back to that in a second. Now, as Christina emphasized, um, the, well, she didn't emphasize this, but the first thing I want to say is we're not really sure what will happen to El Nino in, in the years ahead, but the more solid expectation is that you add El Nino to the warming that is certain, okay, and these kind of extreme events get worse. That's true of many other sorts of extreme events, uh, like, uh, tropical cyclones, hurricanes. Okay. And so whatever happens to El Nino, we know that the consequences of it will be worse. One of the things we're sure of about the future is that uh, when it rains, it's going to tend to rain harder, okay? And El Nino won't make it rain in some place. And when it's dry, it's going to be drier. And in other places, El Nino will have that tendency. Um, that, in a way, is good news. We've made predictions now of El Nino. 
we have learned something, particularly at an institution I helped to uh, found, the International Research Institute for Climate and Society, has learned a great deal about how to use these predictions to help people in places in Africa, in Asia, and so on, the kind of um, uh, developing world countries where it's not a given that, say, some, uh, some bright young commodities broker or hedge fund manager or something will jump on whatever information you have to offer. Now, uh, on the bad side, well, let me start it this way. My, my PhD advisor was a man named Jewel Charney who was responsible for the wor first weather forecasts. And toward the end of his life in 1980, he expressed to me a great disappointment about uh, how little progress there'd been in weather forecasting since the 1950s. And um, since then, I'd say that weather forecasting has made enormous leaps. And a good bit of that has been, I would attribute to two things. The first and probably most important is the just uh, incredible growth in computer power since that time. Uh, we made an El Nino model in 1985 and we would run it to make forecasts, and we would run out a year or two. And what took us an hour to do then takes on as big a computer as we could manage, okay? Now it takes about a second on one of those things that you all have in front of you. Okay. That makes a huge difference in what you can accomplish. Uh, on the other hand, I have to say as somebody who pioneered this kind of forecasting, I'm kind of disappointed too in the lack of progress that we've made in seasonal to interannual forecasting. And part of this is the same issue uh, that compared to the size of the problem, the computing resources are still a little substandard. The other thing I think is that we haven't organized ourselves terribly well to do either the, let's say, decadal forecasting, interannual forecasting, decadal forecasting, or really, to be honest, the problem of forecasting anthropogenic influence on climate change for many years ahead. Okay. Uh, it would take, uh, let's say a more concentrated effort with an enormous amount of more computing power. We know that uh, this would help because we've done enough experiments to see that. The other thing that goes with this is in particular for the El Nino problem, okay, most of the models tend to do a, uh, have strong biases in what the normal, the climatological seasonal cycle is in the Pacific. If you, when you have those biases, you tend to get the variability wrong in some ways. And certainly it's harder to be confident in what you're predicting, okay? So that's, that's something that needs more work. The hopeful note is that, uh, you know, there are many people now working these problems. It would go a lot faster if it were, if the efforts were better funded and better organized. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. We'd like to invite questions from our reporters in the audience. Anyone like to ask a question? Christoph? Christoph Seidler, Der Spiegel in Germany. Um, just a very general level question, but um, you, you've uh, all briefly touched upon this, uh, uh, but still, um, uh, uh, maybe we can have uh, an, an extract in layman's terms. So um, what will the future bring for, for an El Nino? So w of course, we, we've, we've heard a bit, but can you condense it a little bit for me? I can, I can start. I think um, what most of us have mentioned is that um, there is a range of 
possible outcomes coming from the models. There is model disagreement that depends to a big extent on how models are representing mean climate or the seasonal climate that uh, Mark just uh, mentioned. So uh, it is still uncertain. There's very, um, I have in my talk a review paper that um, is, is a good reference for um, the most recent um, information on this. There's um, papers recently that show that if you segregate the models um, based on how well they represent some of the aspects uh, of El Nino, then those models tend to agree more that there will be more frequent, strong El Nino events. But uh, this is still very much of an open question, and um, there is a lot of uncertainty there. Um, I don't know. Yeah, I just want to. So there's two. There's two aspects here. One is the average state of the tropical Pacific, and the other is El Nino actually up and down, like from year to year. And so, um, and both of those things are are still in question. But uh, so what I emphasized was that the average state uh, looks like it could become more El Nino like just based on what we see in the past during times of high CO2. And quite a few climate models predict that. Um, they did in the, in the last a IPCC assessment, and, um, and the new results that are just coming out suggest a similar thing. So, um, so it's, it's not for sure, but that's, so we sort of understand that the mean, the average condition looks more like an El Nino event, if you will. In terms of El Nino itself year to year, that's a little bit more scattered. And so uh, what Christina shows is a tendency for models to predict stronger El Nino. Uh, but on the other hand, if I've got this right, you know, that some of the best models, the ones that simulate El Nino correctly, actually have a more stable response. So, you know, El Nino, it, I think it's still a question, it's still out there whether uh, individual El Nino events will get more extreme. To, and we expect in a warmer climate that we have more extreme rainfall and so on. But as far as El Nino goes, um, that's like a, still a top question uh, in our research community. Yeah, um, but uh, as Mark emphasized, the impact w are certain to become stronger because you're in a warmer atmosphere. So every time there's an El Nino causing a deluge, it will just rain more. And we, we know that will happen because it's controlled by atmospheric thermodynamics. So, I mean, I like to see this problem as a risk assessment. If there's, uh, we will never know if El Nino got stronger. No one will be here and it's a very hard statistical problem, but what if in five years from now there's another big El Nino? We had the strongest El Ninos on record in the last 30 years. So that's suggesting something, but it's hard to tell what's, what caused them. But if, what if we have another one? So how do you attribute whether that event was made, was made worse uh, by a change in climate or not? But I, so I think we cannot rule out that it won't change, but there's, there's this risk that, that, that if, uh, that if a big El Nino happened in, in the next decade, it will have been influenced by changes in climate and the impacts will still be stronger. And also the one thing to, to keep in mind that the global impacts, and those are the teleconnections that Biernes talked in the title of the paper, that's how the impacts are propagated from the equatorial Pacific to everywhere in the world. Those teleconnections can be shifted as the eastern side of the Pacific warms up, then the teleconnections also move to the east. So, in here in California, you get all that rain when there's an El Nino. On average, not every El Nino brings more rain, but on average, but that average pattern can also shift to the east. So sometimes it, the rain can move also with, even though El Nino doesn't become stronger. So I think it's uh, pointing to changes and, and when you shift the pattern, you can go from being impacted one way and you're used to that and then you're impacted in a different way and you're not used to that. But the, I think, the, Mark will say that too, is that we can predict El Nino. So even if the impacts get stronger, we can, we can like six months, maybe eight months in advance, we, we know when El Nino is coming and probably every El Nino will be having worse impacts every, every time. But we have those months that can help societies prepare. So the quick summary is uh, the impacts of El Nino will get worse. Okay. Uh, Exactly what happens to El Nino is hard to say, and not clear it matters a lot in the sense that uh, even you know before we started 
really messing up the atmosphere. The variability in how El Nino occurred was quite extreme, and um, that might continue. It's true we've had a lot of strong El Ninos, uh, the, maybe the strongest in recent years. On the other hand, at the end of the 19th century, there were also very many strong El Ninos, and the most destructive El Nino of, in the last few hundred years was in 1877. Okay, probably tens of millions of people died in famines in India, China, Ethiopia, Northeast Brazil, and other places. So uh, this, this has always happened, but it will on average be getting worse. Th another thing I could say about, it, just to go back to what we don't know, is I've been involved in some work that says, um, well, as you know, anybody who lives in California certainly knows, it's tended to be dry in recent years, and the tropical Pacific has not yet gone into the state we expect of looking more El Nino-like. It looks more the other way, which is what goes with dry in California. Okay. And we've done some work which suggests to us that this is highly unlikely to be due to some random internal variability. That is, it seems far more likely to be some sort of at least transient response to the way we've mucked up the atmosphere already. Okay. But our models don't, aren't getting this. So that's kind of a, a problem for us. In other words, yes, you can worry about El Nino in the future, but we could also start by asking, why aren't we doing a better job on now? Because I'm sure people in California would like to know whether in the next two, three, five, ten years, it's likely to rain more or not. Hi, I'm Mary Miller from the Exploratorium. Um, one of the impacts of El Nino is a, uh, a reduction in upwelling in Peru. Of course, there's also upwelling in California that's very important for ocean ecosystems. I'm wondering if any of the models have enough resolution for you to say what might be happening to upwelling in the future. Uh, yeah. Uh, no, we, there's ways to know because upwelling is still, even though it happens on the coasts and it's, you think it's small scale, but it's controlled by winds and, and in the Pacific everything is coupled. It was also in Bjarne's paper. I mean, everything was in Bjarne's paper. If you read one sentence, it was just like the seed of everything we, we've studied over the decades. But um, so these patterns, like the one that Jessica mentioned, when the when as the planet warms up, the eastern side of the Pacific warms up faster or more, that weakens the trade winds. So it will weaken your upwelling. And, and that's controlled by, I mean, we, we know that very well. It's not uncertain, it's just mechanics. It's Newton's laws. And, and so on, on the equator, if that pattern emerges, upwelling is expected to weaken following the trade winds that are controlled by, by that contrast in warming between one side and the opposite side of the basin because air on the equator likes to flow from colder to warm. Um, then if you focus on, on away from the equator, because Peru is away from the equator, there's other fa factors start mattering and there's other wind patterns that will control the upwelling there. Same thing in, in, in California. Um, but there's huge fisheries also on the equator that will be influenced by those changes. Yeah, I'll just add that one thing that uh, is worrying to me is that in our assessment of the Pliocene three million years ago, the temperatures that we're seeing in the California current and the Peru margin are really toasty, uh, like seven degrees Celsius warmer. And we have quite a few data points off of California in particular, so that result keeps coming up. Um, and actually, we see it elsewhere, like off of South Africa and the Benguela upwelling. So this worries me because the magnitude that we're seeing in the past is, to me, r extremely large. Uh, so assuming there isn't something wrong with our, with our data, um, then we need to explain that, whether that's realistic or not, and whether that has to do with 
uh, you know, the upline zones having this really strong response to high CO2, maybe it involves cloud feedbacks potentially. Uh, so that's something that, that we're definitely looking into. We're, we're uh, as scientists, we're always very cautious, you know, so we don't like to say anything unless we're pretty certain. But if you were doing it from, let's say, a risk assessment point of view, uh, then you would have to say that it's highly likely that the upwelling, uh, you'll go into a more El Nino-like pattern. The upwelling will be diminished. The ecosystems will be disrupted. Um, some of them perhaps will succeed in moving poleward. Other ones um, will not. That's in, you know, the more likely outcome, although from, you know, uh, we using the scientific standard of certainty, we wouldn't say that's, we're terribly confident of that. If you're worried from a risk point of view, you would say, yeah, this is a huge risk. You shouldn't uh, be exposing yourself to it or the planet to it. Aaron, do we have any questions on the chat? One question. Uh, David Appel, uh, freelance, wants to know, is there an underly underlying reason for why El Ninos and La Ninas occur? Yes. <laughs> Go ahead, Hoops. <laughs> oh, okay. You have about two minutes. <laughs> I have about two minutes to, I, I think it goes back to um, the introduction with those, uh, that schematic that has all these processes that come together. I think the question is about that, right? How do you get to have El Nino events? So every few years you have the trade winds uh, uh, slackening, um, so they, you have what we call westerly wind bursts, so uh, anomalous winds uh, uh, that translate into a weakening of the trade winds. And then uh, that gives you um, a heat signature, in a sense, in the, in the East Pacific. You have that warming um, that comes through a, a subsurface heat wave, you can say. So then um, that warming um, leads to a, a shift of the uh, strong precipitation sort of centers from the West Pacific more to the Central Pacific. And from that emanate all these teleconnections outside of the tropics. Um, so it is what I, I mentioned in the presentation. Um, you need, a, in a sense, a perfect storm of a lot of processes, the westerly wind sort of bursts in the west um, to end up with having end the background conditions and what's happening in the extra tropics. That's another uh, uh, sort of um, uh, influence on what's happening in the tropics, you, you might say, uh, that gives you a development of an El Nino event, and how uh, much it will grow or not also depends on <laughs> a lot of these processes. And that's why it's, they're, they're still generally difficult to predict uh, since, you know, the 80s. And also that's why models have challenges, because you need to get all these things right, and especially the clouds that Jessica also mentioned before. Cloud feedbacks are very important, so all of these come together. That chain reaction that makes an El Nino grow in a few months, warm up the Eastern Pacific, is, is actually, we call it the Viernes feedback. It's, it's, it's named it after, after Viernes. Um, but our understanding of El Nino has changed since then. Then La Nina was identified or given a name in the 80s, and the community has worked on that and how they switch phases, how you go from an El Nino. My mom knows that after an El Nino, there's always a La Nina. Especially, I, I grew up in Argentina where El Nino also has impacts on rain, so I remember all the, these El Ninos. Um, so you always know that the after El Nino comes La Nina, but what we also discovered in the, in the last 10 years, or not discovered, but recognized that after La Nina, El Nino doesn't come. So it takes a, a few years until another big El Nino can happen, and predicting that interval is what is challenging, when the next big El Nino will happen. Um, so there's a lot of research Ongoing, people will be talking about that at today's session, about how <coughs> El Nino La Nina change phases. That's still an area of research. El Nino to La Nina is easy. La Nina to El Nino is really hard. But once El Nino is ongoing, we know that after six months, it's gonna peak. Usually around Christmas, that's why it's called El Nino. So we know all those things we know for sure. Um, 
right, many thanks to our panel. And you can reach them one-on-one -on -one if you have more questions. We resume at 10 with Etu Etna, new results from two classic volcanoes.